correct time. Borges' father suffered from poor eyesight, a condition his son would inherit, and the family decided to leave for Europe in order to consult a specialist in Geneva. Led by an indefatigable curiosity, Borges discovered the literature of many authors that would accompany him all his life. The German expressionists, Verlaine, Schopenhauer, and the Buddhist masters who taught him that life was an illusion. In 1914, the war broke out. Obliged to stay in Europe, the Borges became Argentines in exile. Borges attended the Collège Jean Calvin and pursued his studies in French. It was very important for me to be raised in Switzerland and to do my baccalaureate in Geneva and to have stayed in Europe during World War I. It allowed me on my return to rediscover my country. That is to say, if I had spent all my life in Buenos Aires, I would not really have seen it. It would have been too close to me. But there were long years of absence, of unavoidable nostalgia. One could even say of essential nostalgia. I returned to Buenos Aires around 1921 or 22. I rediscovered the city of my birth, the city of my fathers, of my forefathers, of my ancestors. It inspired my first book of poems, called, in fact, Fervor de Buenos Aires. Absence made it possible for me to see things I would not have seen had I stayed at home. And was it along this torpid, muddy river that the prows came to found my native city? The little painted boats must have suffered the steep turf among the root clumps of the horse-brown current. A cigar store perfumed the desert like a rose. The afternoon had established its yesterdays, and men took on together an illusory past. Only one thing was missing. The street had no other side. Hard to believe Buenos Aires had any beginning. I feel it to be as eternal as air and water. We see the constant presence of Buenos Aires throughout his work. But we also see how this presence of the city evolves for him. In his last book, Perhaps sensing his approaching end, he tries to cling to the city that will no longer be his, the city that once belonged to him. The connection is made through a new generation of poets that he says will sing the broken obelisk. And the presence of the city will live on through this new voice that will take up the baton. And if there is continuity, there is immortality. By the time the family returned from Europe, Buenos Aires had become, in Borges' mind, a city where everything was possible, founded like Rome through a myth or a legend and containing an infinity of stories like the Baghdad of the Arabian Nights. The city he'd imagined beyond the garden railings, the city he dreamed of during the years in Switzerland, acquired now a physical reality. He began to wander through Buenos Aires with the passion of an explorer, listening to stories about compadritos in street corner taverns or following their exploits sung to the monotonous strumming of a guitar or the wail of a bandoneon. Nada, solo el cuchillo de muraña, solo en la tarde gris la historia trunca. No sé por qué en las tardes me acompaña ese asesino que no he visto nunca. Palermo era más bajo, era amarillo, Paredón de la cárcel dominaba Raval y Barrial, por esa brava región, 
Anduvo el sórdido cuchillo, el cuchillo, la cara se ha borrado y aquel mercenario cuyo austero oficio era el coraje no ha quedado más que una sombra y un fulgor de acero que el tiempo que los mármoles empaña salva este firme nombre, Juan Muraña. El taco se baila con toda la vida por delante. Obedece al compás más que a la vieja. Oh, ¿Qué hace? No hay caso, no puedo ver como. Low houses, cobbled streets, knives, men dancing tango in badly lit alleys. Out of this grey world, Borges began to spin his own vision of reality. All life long, he remained fascinated by tales of knife fights and secret codes of honor. He saw in these violent lives modest reminiscences of the Iliad and the ancient Viking sagas. With the excuse of compiling the biography of Evaristo Cariego, a poet, friend of his parents, who had sung about the world of the Compadrito, Borges wrote a book that is less about Cariego than about the poetry of Buenos Aires, its landscape, its language, its stories. At the same time, Borges discovered the poetry of the Gauchos, written in the 19th century by Argentinian intellectuals. Today, it's impossible to write a book about gauchos without finding descriptions of the pampas. However, in Martin Fierro, there aren't any, but still we feel the strong presence of the landscape. This is extraordinary because, for example, if you take that other excellent book, Dr. Secundo Sombra, the author abandons the storyline to describe the landscape in detail. But the real peasant doesn't see the landscape for its beauty. That is something reserved for cultured people. In Martin Fierro, there are no descriptions, because the narrator, Emilio Agacha, only sees the landscape for its practicalities. For example, he looks to the sky to see if it's going to rain or not, not for its aesthetic beauty. That's what makes Martin Fierro and Asuka Subi remarkable. They don't give false impressions. For Borges, every story was in some sense universal. What happened in the world of the Gauchos echoed Caesar's murder by his son in front of the Senate in Rome. Destiny takes pleasure in repetition, variance, symmetries. Nineteen centuries later, in the south of the province of Buenos Aires, a gaucho is attacked by other gauchos. As he falls, he recognizes an adopted son of his and says to him with gentle reproof and slow surprise, Pero que. He is being killed, and he does not know he is dying so that a scene may be repeated. For Borges, the core of reality lay in books, reading books, writing in books and about books, Borges continued a dialogue begun thousands of years ago and which he believed would never end. Borges believed that what any man has experienced, every man can experience. And he was not surprised to find among his father's friends a writer who, all on his own,